Father, we thank you for this day, and we just pray that you watch over those who are traveling. Watch over those who are um, with this heat that's going on around and just protect them. I just pray that you bless each person and um, guard our hearts, guard our lives, and um, watch over the person who's about to give the communion, and um, bless Andy in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. <coughs> Good morning. Wow, some people are awake. I mean, I'm hoping it'll be a sh short devotion. Uh, this is out of Experiencing God Day by Day, Henry and Richard Blackaby, okay? Um, it's called Kingdom's Greatness. Comes out of Luke. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves. It is not he who sits at the table, yet I am among you as one who serves. That was Jesus speaking. He says, the measure of greatness in the kingdom of God differs vastly from that of the world. Our society idolizes the rich, the powerful, the beautiful, and the athletes. We even make celebrities out of those who blazingly flaunt their immorality. The world claims it is demeaning to serve others. However, God's kingdom completely rejects the world's measure of for esteem, giving the greatest honor to the one who serves. The, the person who serves selflessly, lovingly, without complaint, and without seeking recognition is highly regarded in the kingdom of God. When Jesus and his disciples entered the upper room, the disciples knew they were going for Passover, which is a great and wonderful event in the Jewish uh, society. Jesus knew he was going to the, his last supper. The disciples looked for a, pre a predominant place to sit next to Jesus. Jesus looked for a place to serve. As they awkwardly awaited to be served, Jesus took a towel and basin and washed their feet. And you can read that in John 13, 1 through 15. We Christians like to refer ourselves as servants, but we are seldom content to be treated as servants. We are tempted to be abducted, abducted to take on the world's evaluation of importance. When we look to Jesus as our model, we see that it takes a far more noble character to serve than to be served. The world will estimate your importance by the number of people serving you. God is more concerned with the number of people you are serving. If you struggle to be a servant, your heart may be shifted away from the heart of God. Ask Jesus to teach you selflessness and to give you the strength to follow his example. Watch for Jesus' invitation to join him in serving others. It will come. Now, this is our 50th year that this, was, this church has had services here. 50 years ago, I was a 10-year-old living in Hawaii, okay? Never thought I would be here. But I have spent my entire life, folks, in churches. And the joke has always been the 20 percenters of the church do 100% of the work in the church. Every church I've ever been in has always been the same. And the scary thought is that I just talked to some folks who told me that that is not true anymore. It's less than 10% of the people that come to this church do all the work in this church. Now, I just wanna tell you that those of you that are serving in this church, I thank you, we thank you. And you know, 13 days ago, I was preparing for a celebration for my father's funeral and a truckload, of, a busload of people from this church who really didn't know my dad drove to Ocala and showed up and gave me a hug. That was important to me. That restored my, my feelings about my church. And I just ask that as you begin to take communion today, 
Look around for places. Ask Jesus, where can I serve you today in my church? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for this church, and I thank you for the wonderful, lovely people that are here and that want to, want to know you and serve you. And Lord, as they seek, seek your face, show them how to be the hands and the feet of this church today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. It's wonderful. We're going to take up our offering, folks. This is a ch this is a chance to show your love and respect for our God, the Father, who will who doesn't need our offering. You know, people would people would say, "Oh, don't say that." You know what? I said this is a chance to show um, to offer up uh, to worship God. This is a, this is a chance to worship God with our offerings. And Lord, I'm going to pray for it now. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to give to you and to give to this church and to offer up our offerings joyfully to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Once I said yes to Jesus, I was committed. I was all in. I believe that the measure of success in the kingdom of God is obedience. I want my life to reflect obedience to Christ and to live in obedience to him. I think that Jesus is worth it. He's worth everything. In 2018, with the backing of his missions agency, John went to North Sentinel Island. He knew the risks, but his passion for the North Sentinel Lees and his desire to be obedient to Christ drove him forward. Sitting in the boat, getting ready to go ashore, John penned a final note and a challenge to his family. You guys might think I'm crazy in all this, but I think it's worth it to declare Jesus to these people. Please do not be angry at them or at God if I get killed. Rather, please live your lives in obedience to whatever he has called you to, and I'll see you again when you pass through the veil. The eternal lives of this tribe is at hand, and I can't wait to see them around the throne of God, worshiping in their own language as Revelation 7, 9 to 10 states. I pray none of you love anything in this world more than Jesus Christ. Within hours of writing those words, John Chow was killed by the Islanders. John believed that the measure of success in the kingdom of God is obedience, and he would be obedient to God's call, no matter the cost. Who will pay the price to go to every tribe? We are always inspired by stories like people are counting the cost and are willing to go to any length to share the gospel with others. We're glad that you're here this morning worshiping with us and many are joining us online and we're glad that you were able to find us and be able to worship with us today. Before I begin, uh, as you know, two days ago, the Supreme Court of the United States overturned a federal law known as Roe versus Wade that made ending the life of a child in the womb legal in all 50 states. That law had stood for nearly 50 years. And in that time, it's estimated that more than 63 million babies have been aborted. Just to kind of put that number in perspective, According to the United Nations, the number of abortions performed in our country alone since 1973 exceeds the population of 90% of the world's countries and dependent territories. Now uh, it's up to the 50 states to determine their own laws. And here in Florida on July 1st, a new law will go into effect banning abortions after 15 weeks. Some states like Arkansas, Mississippi, and Texas have so-called trigger uh, laws on the books that will go into effect immediately now that Roe versus Wade has been overturned and will ban all abortions. And so uh, it, it really is a, a generational, once-in-a-lifetime thing for many people. I mean, I was alive when, when Roe versus Wade was, uh, was made legal and could not imagine and, and just prayed uh, like many people have for 50 years for this thing to be overturned. And uh, we, we got to see that historic day on Friday. So let's, let's before we begin, let's just pray and uh, thank God. God, we, we thank you first that this evil law, which has hung as a dark and shameful cloud over our nation for a generation, has been overturned. And I pray that you'll forgive us for our blatant disregard for the sanctity of the life of the unborn and help us as followers of Christ to always seek justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with you as we continue to uphold the value of all life. And we pray this in the name of the one who knew us and formed us in the womb. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 
Dr. Michael Youssef, in his book, Hope for This Present Crisis, uh, subtitled The Persecution of the Modern Day Church in America, says, the post-Christian times in which we live are very much like the early Christian era in the book of Acts. The dominant culture hated Christianity and tried to stamp it out. He goes on to say, over the last year and a half, restrictions placed on churches during the COVID-19 pandemic and rising censorship of faith-based organizations and leaders have made it all the more apparent that opposition toward the Christian faith is only increasing. I think we're only seeing the beginning, he says, of the unfair treatment and persecution that lies ahead for the church. He says, I believe we are heading into a time of severe testing where we are about to find out if we are made of the same stuff as the apostles. We're about to find out if we're willing to stand for God's truth, whatever the cost. When you see the boldness of people like John Chow, you see the boldness of the early Christians in the book of Acts and their willingness to face persecution and even giving their lives for their faith. You realize they were so devoted to Christ because they knew their victory had already been decided. In fact, disciples who know their victory has been decided will be the most devoted. And so we're in the book of Colossians, if you're just joining us here for the first time, and we're seeing how Paul, a missionary and a church planter, did not just want people to come to Christ, but he wanted people to come to maturity in Christ. And the verb that he used used is the word rooted. He wants Christians to be rooted in the life of Christ, because if there's a good root then you will bear good fruit. So we've already talked about being rooted in the gospel of Christ and rooted in the wisdom of Christ and rooted in the supremacy of Christ. And what we want to do today is talk about being rooted in the triumph of Christ. So we're going to read our text this morning, beginning in Colossians 2, verse 9 through the end of the chapter. Paul writes, for in Christ all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead." When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross." Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let let anyone who delights in false humility or the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen. They are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They have lost connection with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow." Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on human commands and teachings. Such regulations, indeed, have the appearance of wisdom, 
with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Now, that's a lot to unpack. And, and there are many phrases that I could lock onto and we could dig into together this morning. But I want to focus on one phrase that just jumped off the page to me as I was preparing for this message. And that phrase is triumphing over them by the cross. Now, you would be hard-pressed back in the first century to find anybody who would put the word triumph and the word cross in the same sentence. Because in their world, the cross was proof that you lost, not that you won. 600 years before Jesus died on the cross, there was an Olympic Games held in Greece. And there was a man named Orikion who was vying for his third championship in a sport that was kind of a mix between boxing and wrestling. He was in the final match and his opponent had him in a stranglehold, a life-threatening hold. And Arikion was desperate and he, he was able to grab his opponent's ankle and dislocate it. The guy was in so much pain, he held up his hand to concede the match. But Arikion died in the stranglehold. And due to the sequence of events, the judges ruled that Arikion is the only person in Olympic history who died but still won the match. Well, that's what happened at the cross. The enemy thought what was going to be a win turned out to actually be a crushing defeat. And when you're sure of the outcome of Calvary, it sure does change your outlook on life. Because mature believers are secure believers. They are mature because they're rooted in the triumph of Jesus on their behalf. They don't engage the enemy for victory. We engage the enemy from victory because Jesus died on the cross and his triumph gives us the assurance and an unconquerable Confidence. I want to share with you quickly this morning three things that a mature believer is absolutely convinced of. Here's the first, that Jesus' triumph puts our deadness to death. Now, in this series, we've talked about some of the reasons why Christians stay immature in their faith. I think one of them is simply a misdiagnosis of their spiritual condition. You will remain in immaturity if you believe what all, all that you really need is a resuscitation and not a resurrection. Because you're really not dead, you think. I'm just sick and I need something or someone to help me get better. This is why many Christians are susceptible to legalism. Now, legalism is, understand, legalism is not obeying God. Legalism is believing that your obedience somehow saves you. Legalism is, in essence, thinking, I can do something to improve myself so that I will impress God. Nobody ever plans to be a legalist. It's kind of like eating at Denny's. You never really intend to go there, just sometimes you wind up there, right? I'm glad some of you got that. So if, if, you, if your thinking is, you know what, I'm, I'm just, I'm really not a bad person. I'm just sick. I need to do something to get better so that God will like me more then you are going to be susceptible to all kinds of self-help plans out there in our world today. And guess what? The same plans out there in our world today are the same ones Paul talked about in his day. They're still available. Paul mentions, for instance, the special day plan. You know, pick out certain days on the calendar and make those holier than any other days. The special diet plan. Be sure you don't eat that, but eat this. And be sure you don't drink that, but drink this. 
He mentions the special encounter plan. Oh, have you, have you had this experience yet? Maybe a visit from an angel? Have you had some kind of a mystical moment? Or the special behavior plan? Stop doing that. Don't touch this and do a whole lot more of this. See, we've got the same plans available to us, and they all fail because they all misdiagnose the real problem. Paul puts it like this back in verse 23. These rules may seem wise because they require strong devotion, pious self-denial, and severe bodily discipline, but they provide no help in conquering a person's evil desires. You can't fix what's wrong on the inside by simply polishing the outside. See, legalism can only produce haughtiness. It can puff you up because you know you're working a plan that nobody else is or they're not working it as well as you are. It can produce haughtiness, but legalism cannot produce holiness because it's based on a misdiagnosis. Okay, bad joke warning. All right, just giving you a heads up here. So a man takes the body of his dog, limp and lifeless, to a vet, lays the dog on the examination table. The vet comes in, gets a stethoscope out, listens for a few minutes and says, I'm sorry, your dog is dead. Dead? You haven't even run any tests. I want a second opinion. So the vet leaves and comes back with a Labrador retriever. Dog sniffs all around that carcass, no movement or any sign of life. Then he goes and gets a cat. Cat crawls all over that body and there's no movement. And the vet says, I'm sorry, but your dog is dead. That'll be $600. $600 for telling me my dog is dead? The vet said, well, it only would have been $50, but you insisted on the lab work and the cat scan. I told you it was bad. <laughs> don't be mad. But it does make a point. We don't want to believe that we're dead. We just want to believe that we're sick and somebody can do something to help us fix it. Listen to me. The gospel is not good advice for the sick. It is good news for the dead. Listen to what Paul says in verse 13. You were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ and he forgave all your sins. How did you get alive? God did it. The answer you needed was not some correction in your life. You needed a new creation. And the answer is union with Christ who can put your deadness to death when you're buried with him. And when that happens, the Bible says your union with Christ means that his righteousness gets imputed to you. It's not God saying, hey, here's a plan so that you can improve your personal grades. It's God saying, here's the good news that Jesus wants to give you his report card. You get the righteousness of Christ imputed to you, the righteousness of Christ imparted to you because you're raised to a new life now and the Holy Spirit starts doing a work on the inside that no plan on the outside could ever do. You've heard of the legend of Hercules who had to clean the Agian stables that for years had been filled with hundreds and hundreds of cattle. And he realized, Hercules did, even with my great strength, I could never make this clean. So according to legend, he diverted a river and let the power of that water flowing through cleanse the stable. 
Well, the Bible says, in effect, that's what happens when you and I unite with Christ in baptism. The living water of the Holy Spirit is now imparted to us to do in us from the inside what we could never do for ourselves on the outside alone. Our victory over sin is now possible because Jesus put our deadness to death and we are now alive in him. Now, does that mean we'll never sin? No. But when we do, we know that our outlook for victory has not changed one bit. And that's because the second thing we're secure in is that Jesus' triumph puts my sin debt away forever. Now, the devil has lost. He knows it. He is vanquished, but he is not yet vanished. He's still around and doing work until God ultimately throws him into the lake of fire. What that means is that he's still able to harass you and me, especially one of his favorite tactics is to bring to mind past failures that derail you and stunt your future growth. And you know what I'm talking about. You've had this experience. You're just out taking a walk. You're out driving somewhere, maybe just standing in the shower some morning, and all of a sudden you have this memory flash into your thoughts of something in your past that brings you shame. That's the enemy at work. And when a moment like that occurs, and it will... You and I need to stay rooted in the triumph of Christ. Listen again to what Paul says in verse 13. He forgave how many? All of our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Did you hear what Paul said? That on the cross... Jesus did not just remove my debt. He destroyed the document on which my debt had been recorded. Paul uses a really powerful word picture here that doesn't necessarily show up in the English translations. But in the Greek language, that word canceled means to wipe off. And his readers would have gotten that picture because in those days when you wrote something on parchment with ink, the ink did not have acid in it, so it did not bite and grip into that parchment fiber. So if you wanted to use the parchment again, you simply got a cloth and you wiped that ink off. And there would be no evidence that anything was ever written on that parchment. Now listen to me, folks. If you want to be a mature Christian, stop walking around like you have a rap sheet in heaven. You don't have a rap sheet in heaven. There is in heaven no record of your sin. What does God say in Hebrews chapter 8? I will forgive their wickedness and I will never again remember their sins. So stop remembering what the highest court in the universe has no record of. When the enemy reminds you of your failures, you remind him of the triumph of Jesus. You take him back to what happened at the cross. Because here's the third thing that a mature believer is secure in, that Jesus' triumph put the futility of the enemy on display. Because again, back in the first century, if you were on the cross, everyone thought, well, you lost. And one way they communicated that is they stripped you naked so that you would die publicly disgraced. And it probably looked like that's what happened to Jesus. But if you could have torn back the veil and looked into the heavenlies, you would realize that actually it was the other way around. On the cross, Satan was being stripped and disgraced. And at the cross, Satan was exposed as history's biggest loser. Look at verse 15 again from the New Living Translation. 
Jesus disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them at the cross. This was always the mission of Jesus. His birth at Bethlehem was D-Day because Jesus came intentionally to invade territory that was held by the enemy and defeat once and for all the enemies and the powers of darkness. And so when you read in the Gospels that Jesus healed somebody or that Jesus uh, cast out a demon, realize that those exorcisms and those healings were more than just miracles, they were acts of war. They are Jesus going to toe, going toe to toe with the enemy, looking at the consequences of sin in this world and saying, but I want that one for the kingdom of God. And they must be released because sin and death have no authority over me. And the war's outcome was already decided at Calvary. Jesus knew what it would take to win the war. Even before he went to the cross, it says in John chapter 12, Jesus said, the time for judging this world has come when Satan, the ruler of this world, will be cast out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. Jesus said, they're going to lift me up on a cross. And when they do, I'm going to throw Satan down. And everything that has kept people captive and away from God is going to be dismantled and destroyed. Satan will be disarmed. The power of sin, the fear of death will no longer be able to have its hold on people. So do you understand then how significant it is when somebody confesses Christ and we get to witness a baptism into him? Every single conversion is a powerful encounter in which Satan is compelled to release someone who wants to give their life and surrender to Christ because Satan has no authority over them. The enemy has to acknowledge the triumph of Jesus. He cannot hold on to anybody who has been united with Christ. In fact, I would argue that that's why Satan respects baptism more than many Christians do. Because he understands the cosmic consequences of being united with the death and the resurrection of Jesus. I've told the story before of evangelist Malcolm Smith from England who had a preacher friend here in America who told him the story that I'm about to tell you that a woman in California flew to visit a friend of hers who had moved away. The woman from California was a witch. She worshiped Satan. She was not expecting to find out when she landed that her friends had become Christians. And she was not expecting that her friends would take her to church on Saturday night to worship Jesus. And she was certainly not expecting the Holy Spirit to convict her heart. She spent all night with the pastor and her friends talking about her decision and on Sunday morning gave her life to Christ and was baptized. When her boyfriend back in California, who was a sorcerer, learned what had happened, he was livid. He got on a plane, he flew to that city, he found the church, barged into the office demanding that he see the pastor. He spewed all kinds of vulgarity and threatened violence, demanding to know where his girlfriend was. He said to the pastor, you can't have that woman. She is Satan's woman, she's my woman, and I've come to take her back. And the pastor, literally fearing that violence could break out, eventually shared with the man where she was staying. And as he stormed out of the pastor's study, he was still spewing all kinds of vulgarity, but he turned and said, just tell me one thing. Tell me you did not baptize her yet. And with that, the pastor said, well, actually, I baptized her myself yesterday morning. And all the color went out from that sorcerer's face. And he said meekly, well, then it's too late. I can't touch her now. I promise you 
The powers of darkness know well exactly what it means for them when somebody has united with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So look again at what Paul says in verse 12. For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized, and with him you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. Listen, baptism is many things, but it is especially publicly declaring my faith in Jesus' triumph. Publicly letting everyone know, I believe Jesus won. And that declaration is actually your participation in the greatest victory ever. And many of us are experiencing now a new kind of freedom and a new power that we didn't know we could have as long as we were trying to fix ourselves because we are now rooted in that triumph of Jesus. But maybe some here this morning or some watching us online are not. In fact, some of you have not been baptized. And I just want to ask you this morning, why not? Why not? Maybe you're thinking, well, you know, I was baptized as, a, as an infant by my parents, and I don't want them to think that I'm rejecting their desire. You're not rejecting. You're confirming their desire. They wanted you to be devoted to Jesus. And in your baptism, you are owning for yourself the faith that they hoped you would have. I talk to some people who haven't been baptized because they are afraid of water. Now, let me just say, following Jesus means sometimes we have to step out in courage, surrendering our fears to him. But secondly, let me just assure you, I've been doing this for over 20 years now here at this church, and nobody has drowned by faith in our baptistry, all right? And I promise you, I won't let that happen. Maybe somebody here today is thinking, well, uh, I didn't come planning to be baptized today. Well, you know what? On the day of Pentecost, when people heard the first gospel sermon, 3,000 people got baptized that day. Not one of them woke up that morning planning to be baptized. Listen, we've got the towels, we've got the robes, the water's ready. The Bible never says tomorrow is the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. But maybe some of you have not been baptized because you believed a misdiagnosis. If I just grit my teeth, if I just try a little harder, if I just could woulda, coulda, shoulda, I could fix myself. Listen to me. The old you does not need to be cured. The old you needs to be buried. And the new you needs to be raised in Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so I am declaring that the death and resurrection of Jesus is the greatest triumph in eternity. And he's inviting you to come share it with him for all eternity. So I'm going to ask you to stand right now. And I'm going to pray over you. And after my prayer... We're going to sing a song, and I'm going to ask you to come and be baptized. If you're watching online, you just contact us and let us know that you want to be baptized, and we will work with you to make that a reality. But let's just pray before we sing. So, God, I thank you in the powerful name of Jesus for what you and only you could do, and that is bring dead people back to life. We are declaring, Lord, today that we believe Jesus won and that our old self can be put to death and be buried and then raised to a new life where our sins are completely forgiven and the enemy's hold on us can be completely relinquished and released forever. God, we're declaring in faith that we trust in the mighty power of Jesus. And I'm I'm praying right now, God, that somebody is ready to be united with his death and resurrection through the faith act of baptism. 
And God, we're thanking you in advance for what you're doing at our church as a people as we declare our faith that we believe Jesus has won and we're joining in that victory. And we give you thanks for all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So now, if you're ready, or even if you weren't prepared ahead of time, but you want to participate in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus today through baptism, you come down, you meet me here in the front while we're singing, and we'll rejoice together. Let's sing this last song. Mm -hmm. 